Welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna be brewing a monster of a beer. Some might say a Loch Ness monster. Hey, if it's the first time here, I just wanna welcome you to the channel. It's all about uh, making grand glass videos where I take a beer all the way from the recipe stage, through the brew, through the fermentation, to the final tasting, all in single video so that you get to see everything that happened along the way and you get to see how the final beer was influenced by things that happened earlier on in the process. If you like that kind of thing, go ahead and subscribe, hit the like button for these videos, it helps quite a bit. And if you happen to see a beer that you might like to make, in every single video in the description box, there's a complete recipe for the system that I used and the beer that I made in that particular video. So here it is a, it's been an uncharacteristically warm November here, although now it's kind of looking more normal as it's damp, cloudy, dreary, kind of wet November day. Um, perfect weather for brewing a scotch ale. But it's not just any scotch ale we're brewing today, it's a wee heavy, which is the biggest, strongest, and uh, probably most prolific scotch ale. So just like English pale ale, uh, scotch ale has several different strengths, um, but they're relatively similar recipes. The only difference between them all is just the amount of ingredients involved. So just like in English pale ales, you have your kind of, your light, your mild, your medium, your standard, and your export or strong version of pretty much the same beer. The Scottish styles, they're light, um, there's the, the Scottish light, there's the Scottish heavy, and there's the Scottish export, uh, all of which are increasing in strength. And then of course we get our wee heavy, which is just an absurdly strong beer. Now, formally these used to be known by like something like 40 shillings, 60 shilling, and 80 shilling ales. And you might see that as represented as the slash dash notation. That supposedly refers to the cost of the actual cask of the particular ale of your choice. So a lower number would refer to a lower amount of ingredients involved, therefore a lower cost of the cask, and also a lower uh, percentage of ABV. Supposedly that wasn't really a thing until like the middle of the 20th century, so uh, I'm not 100% sure because my research has not been that deep. Um, but for those of you who live across the pond, let me know, uh, because I'm curious. Scottish ales are similar to English pale ales in their design, um, but there's a couple tweaks on them that make them a little bit more malt forward, a little less hop forward. A lot more caramel and uh, fruit, dark fruit specifically, uh, flavors that are coming forward uh, as opposed to the English typical biscuity bready flavors. Uh, there's also a lot less hops that are involved. Uh, the Scottish ales are decidedly malt forward. Uh, you have barely any hopping whatsoever. And at the same time, they're going to be a little bit darker uh, than your typical English ale. And the nice thing about them is despite being a little bit sweeter, having a little bit higher finishing gravities, they still retain that same excellent drinkability that comes from beers made in the British Isles. I chose to brew a wee heavy because it's been a very, very long time since I've made a truly massive beer. Um, we're hoping, hopefully, that this is going to be a uh, good eight or 9% ABV beer. Uh, something that is going to age very well. Uh, it's November now. I'm not really expecting to drink this until at least mid-December. So we're talking a very extended fermentation and a pretty complicated beer overall, but it hopefully will be worth it. I'm hoping to nail that perfect middle ground where you can simultaneously have a beer that is very high ABV, but also very sweet and not cloying and also not fuel-like. Uh, so it's gonna require some pretty careful process tweaks here. Um, at the same time, I've also been curious about torture testing my claw hammer system. So last brew we made a Hellas with it, um, which was actually only three days ago. And if you look back at that video, it was like 75 degrees and beautiful out, but now it's this. So welcome to New England. Last brew was a Hellas. It was very simple, very light, very easy brew for the system to handle. And now I'm going to be maxing it out with a nearly 18 pound grain bill. And uh, we're just gonna see what happens when I try to put this thing through its paces. So if you guys are, out there and you own a claw hammer system, you're probably going to uh, know exactly what this is like. Um, but for those of you who are curious about purchasing one of these or seeing what it can do, um, I'm interested to find out just as much as you are. So I'll do my best to document that process. So let's go into the recipe now. I've got 15 pounds of British pale ale malt uh, for starters. <laughs> um, you can use Maris Otter um, or Golden Promise is what I chose to use. We're doing a pound and a quarter of special roast, which is going to give a bready, um, slightly toasted character. We're gonna do half a pound of Crystal 120, which is that dark, deep, borderline roasted crystal malt uh, that should give us a lot of dark fruit flavors and some sweetness, as well as residual sugars. We're adding half a pound of pale chocolate malt, which is going to give color and also some nuttiness and some more added residual sugars half a pound of melanoidin malt because I'm not sure whether or not I'm going to do an extended boil on this. More on that later. 
Um, but that melanoidin malt kind of keeps a little bit of a buffer in there in terms of giving additional melanoidins or deep caramelized sugars uh, and the characters of that into the beer itself, as well as a handful of black malt. Uh, I am literally talking a handful. I didn't measure this. My best guess is about half an ounce. Um, and that is just for color and a kiss of roastedness. For hops, we're using two ounces of East Kent Goldings at 60 minutes and one ounce of Fuggles at five minutes. This is going to give us just a little bit of, it's actually 30 IBUs, but for a beer this strong, that's nothing. Um, so very much a malt forward beer, but just enough hops to keep it from being too sweet. Uh, for yeast, I made an enormous starter of Yeast 1728, which is their Scottish ale strain. Um, I highly recommend making a starter if your gravity is going to be in the neighborhood of 1070 or 1080. Uh, like mine is going to be almost 1090, hopefully. Um, but uh, having that starter is going to help guarantee you have a better fermentation. Uh, with an OG this high, I wouldn't even recommend going for multiple yeast packets unless you want to pitch like three or four. Uh, so. I would highly recommend doing a starter for this. Last but certainly not least is water. So like I said before, now that I have a manufactured system, um, I'm changing everything in my recipes to be exactly replicable for everybody who has one of these systems. And also I'm gonna add the same concept to my water profiles. So we're starting with a distilled water base. Uh, so I have eight and a half gallons of distilled water that I put into the kettle. We are using a water profile um, that is geared towards amber beers and a slightly malty profile. So I have 57 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, 17 parts per million of sodium, 60 parts per million of sulfate, 75 parts per million of chloride, and 45 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that off of distilled water for eight and a half gallons, add two grams of gypsum, two grams of Epsom, five grams of calcium chloride, and two grams of baking soda. So that should get us a relatively malt forward, but also somewhat balanced profile that is friendly towards darker amber beers. Uh, and this is gonna be a, kind of a brownish red color. Uh, so we're gonna want a little bit of bicarbonate in there as a pH buffer. We are gonna mash this low at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 to 90 minutes. We have so much residual sugar in there, there's no need to mash it high. It's still gonna have a pretty high finishing gravity. And uh, so our boil, like I said, I was gonna talk about this later. So <laughs> traditionally, these beers have been boiled for two or three hours in order to encourage kettle caramelization, which gives you those melanoidin characters. At the same time, I don't know if the 1650 watt element in here is really gonna do much for kettle caramelization. And I really don't wanna risk scorching the beer on the element itself. So that's why I'm leaving that up to whether or not my mash actually works. If my mash works and I get a good pre-boil gravity, then I will probably just go ahead and do a 60 minute boil. Otherwise, I will go ahead and do a two hour boil and we'll see what happens. So I'll let you guys know uh, once we get to the boil section of this video, you'll see whether or not I end up doing a 60 or 120 minute boil. So anyway, everything's up to temp now, so we're gonna go ahead and mash in. Grain bill's so big, I put it into a bucket. All right, so that little bit that I drew off was probably about half a gallon. Um, I'm probably gonna draw off a little bit more, to be honest, because I need space for the recirculation to go through. Again, if I run into issues with my mash efficiency, I can just boil a bit longer to get that gravity back up. So for now, we're gonna draw off a little bit more liquid and uh, try to get the recirc set up. So it looks like we might have overshot our mash pH a little bit. That's 100% my fault because I took an earlier pH reading, saw that it was a little low, decided to overcompensate by adding a little baking soda to the mash. Turns out that that was a little too much and um, now it shot into the 5.6 range, which is, it's fine for this beer. Um, it's not gonna really ruin anything, but it might mute some of those flavors down the line. If you, I'd say if you're making this recipe, uh, do what I didn't do and trust the water profile. 
All right, so in this clip, I ended up actually having unusable audio. For some reason, I forgot to press record on my audio recorder and we had some issues, but I'm basically just explaining that I chose to actually let this mash go for 90 minutes instead of 60 minutes because it wasn't completely finished conversion yet. And so I let it go for that additional half hour. And then I explained how I was about to go uh, raise everything up to the mash out temperature of 168 so that we would have an easier time laudering and drinking the grain basket. So this is our pre-boil, believe it or not, gravity. That is 17.2 bricks, which is exactly 1070. Uh, so we actually nailed our pre-boil gravity to the mark. All right, so at this point, we've been sitting at mash out temps for a while. So I'm gonna go ahead and start um, the process of laudering, which is just simply pulling the basket out and letting it drain. So uh, I'm gonna start by pausing the pump. And now the part uh, that Last time was really difficult with a 10 pound grain bill. Uh, now I have this on the ground, should be able to get some more leverage because uh, I'm doing this by myself. It's pulling everything out. All right, so we're gonna let it drain for probably 10 or 15 minutes. There's a lot of liquid that's gotta get out of this. Uh, and then as we do that, we'll take the element and we'll fire it up to 100% power and uh, keep the lid on, hopefully retain some of that heat. At this point, we are now just about two or three degrees away from the boil. The system does require you to keep the lid sort of cracked on it to help maintain heat inside. It's just that one 1650 watt element. It's, uh, it needs a little help, <laughs> essentially. So, uh, and that's fine, it's got a crack here to allow any volatiles to escape uh, while still retaining a good portion of the heat. Uh, so I'm um, just gonna do a quick recap based on what happened with the mash. Uh, so as you saw, we ended up with a really good on-target pre-boil gravity of uh, 1070, which is really awesome. Um, but that came at kind of a sacrifice. So as you saw when I was mashing in, I had to draw off a decent amount of liquid and uh, that brought down the volume of water inside the kettle to a point where uh, if I do a two hour boil now, I'm actually not going to have full five gallons of work. So after draining the grain basket for about half an hour, um, I, was ended, I ended up with a total of six gallons of work. And uh, it's at that gravity that I want. So at this point with six gallons, it's just enough for a 60 minute boil. So we're gonna go ahead with a 60 minute boil instead of a uh, two hour boil. So I can ensure that I have enough beer left over to enjoy and get into the fermenter and have a full five gallon keg at the end of this process. So I would definitely recommend having um, maybe eight gallons of water instead of eight and a half gallons of water. I think I overshot the water and grain in this particular brew uh, and it ended up costing me a little bit. Now we are very much boiling. So it's time to add our 60 minute bittering addition, which is this two ounce charge of East Kent Goldings. Let's go in right now and we'll come back with five minutes left in the boil and uh, add the rest of the stuff. So I will catch you guys then. So while I'm sitting outside and it's cold, a cold beer is not as appetizing as a warming scotch, especially considering I'm actually brewing a scotch ale here. Um, this actually is a uh, Laphroaig 10 tenure, which is one of my favorites. But anyway, this is a very smoky, peaty whiskey, which leads me to... Um, a very important point that I failed to make earlier when I was talking about the recipe. If you're gonna make a scotch ale, I highly, 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 highly discourage you from putting peat malt or smoked malt into the grain bill whatsoever. Not even a tiny, tiny bit because it will definitely come through and it will mess up the flavor of the beer. Smoky, peaty flavors don't really go very well with sweet caramel flavors, which is what the beer is like. Distilled scotch whiskeys have nothing in common with scotch beer, and there's absolutely no reason to put peat malt in there. It's not traditionally done that way, and the flavors don't work. So I just discourage you from making a large mistake. All right, so we're now about five minutes from the end of the boil, so it's time to add, first of all, our five minute addition. This is one ounce of Focals. And we're also gonna add the, uh, this here, which is a World Flock tablet and a lot of yeast nutrient. So we'll let that keep going for a bit. And then the other thing we're gonna do around this period of time, you guessed it, recirculate uh, boiling wort through the chilling system so that we can sanitize the inside of it for the last five or so minutes of the boil. So I already have everything hooked up now. So I'm just gonna go ahead and feed this into the kettle like so. 
So last five minutes have elapsed, so it's time to just shut everything down and start cooling. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, turn off the element, turn off the pump for now. I'm gonna take this whole thing into my kitchen where my cold water is, and I will start the chilling process. All right, so overall, it was a pretty good brew day. Uh, that was two for two now. So, <laughs> so both a normal strength, normal complexity beer and a high gravity, super complex beer, both work pretty well on this claw hammer system. So I'm definitely proud to say that. And you can see that it actually does produce the good beer. It's not just me talking it up. All right, so I'm not really gonna sugarcoat it. This beer is going to be a huge pain in the butt to ferment. This is such a high gravity wort, you're really gonna have to treat it carefully. I think that's a mistake that a lot of new and inexperienced brewers kind of tend to make. So I think a lot of people, myself included, when we started brewing, we, we automatically went towards the highest alcohol beer we could possibly make. Um, without really realizing that those are some of the most difficult beers to actually get right. So uh, these beers require patience, time, and precision in the fermentation. So when we pitch our yeast, number one, we're going to make sure we pitch enough yeast. If you choose to use dry yeast instead of the liquid yeast, make sure you pitch at least two packets and make sure that they are rehydrated prior to pitching them. If you pitch the liquid yeast, like I am doing, make sure you have a huge starter. Now we're gonna go ahead and pitch our liquid yeast here in a moment. And in so doing, uh, we need to make sure that the wort is adequately oxygenated. So uh, it's with a beer like this, and the higher the gravity you go, the more oxygen you need. Realistically, right now, my best methods are splashing it into the fermenter and then shaking the crap out of the fermenter uh, for like a couple minutes. Uh, and that's probably not even enough oxygen ingress. Uh, ideally, you're going to want some sort of aeration stone or oxygen stone, um, pure oxygen going into the fermenter. I don't have that capability, but you can get by with what I'm doing. It's just going to result in a slightly more sluggish fermentation. Um, which is fine because we're planning on fermenting this for a full month. The first, uh, Two or three weeks are going to be the primary stage, and then after that, it's just going to be pure conditioning. With an English-based yeast like this, uh, you're going to want to start it cold, so mid-60s uh, or lower Fahrenheit, uh, because that is going to help basically cut down the amount of uh, off flavors that are produced in the first few days of fermentation. Because a beer is such high gravity like this, the yeast are going to go absolutely ballistic when they first go in there, because there's just so many sugars and it's just an absolute feast for them. Uh, they're going to reproduce like mad, and they're going to chew up all those sugars real fast, and then they're also going to crap out a whole bunch of nasty tasting flavors. So they need time to consume those and clean them up. And that is what the whole point of that long conditioning phase is for. Now, the hotter you ferment that thing at the beginning, the more off flavors that yeast is going to produce in the long run. Uh, so that's why it's beneficial to start it cold. But then as this fermentation continues, we're going to try and ramp things up a little bit more towards 70 degrees uh, as the time goes on. So probably like at least maybe a week and a half down the road, then we'll start bringing the temperature up. That is going to encourage attenuation, and it's also going to encourage the yeast to completely ferment out as much stuff as they can. There's going to be plenty of unfermentable sugars in there. We don't need any additional fermentable sugars in there lying around because the yeast got tired and fell out of solution. Keeping that temperature steadily increasing over the entire time of fermentation is going to keep your yeast active. At the end of the day, though, we're going to start it at 65. We're going to ramp up to 70 over the course of two or three weeks, and then we're going to cold condition it at about 50 or 60 degrees for a total of a month at least. So this is actually our OG, which is 17 bricks, which is lower than my pre-boil OG. I don't know what the hell happened here, but I think my refractometer needs to be recalibrated. I've had readings all over the place on this refractometer lately, and I'm not sure what's going on, but I have a feeling my pre-boil was definitely not correct. Final gravity for the Wee Heavy has gotten down to a surprisingly low 1015. Uh, so bit lower than usual for the style, but uh, I think it's ready. Uh, all right, so after reaching that final gravity of 1015, which I'll say again is quite low for this style, uh, we kegged the beer, and um, then it's been conditioning in that keg 
uh, basically for the last month or so. Today is uh, December 16th, so it's officially been a full month since we uh, pitched the yeast. Over the last several weeks, I've been pouring myself basically just little samples here and there uh, from the keg uh, as it evolves and as it ages, just to track and see how the flavor changes over time. Uh, and it's actually been pretty cool to see how that has changed over time. And I think right now we've reached a point where the flavors are really kind of starting to sing. So overall, fermentation went very well and pretty much according to plan, so I don't really see anything else to talk about regarding that. So let's go ahead and jump into the beer tasting. All right, so it is called Say Hello to My Wee Beer, and it is 8% ABV and 29 IBUs. So for appearance of the beer, at first it appears a very dark brown color, but in fact it's actually more of a red color. Um, it appears brown without light behind it, but when you hold it up to the light, it looks very much like a Belgian quad. It's it's like a deep ruby red uh, that looks brown otherwise. Overall, it's not too heavily carbonated, but it comes with a pretty decent head on it, which is kind of a tan slash cream color. It does come with some decent lacing though, and you'll see that the uh, head does stay around on the beer for a while. All right, so now we'll go in towards aroma. Uh, so the aroma of the beer is is mostly like a dark bread crust. Um, smells almost like a doppelbach, actually. Um, it has, yeah, dark bread crust kind of character. Uh, however, it does not have as much of a strong bread crust as the doppelbach does. Uh, it's just more of the dominant aroma here. Um, that also is backed up by some dark fig-like notes and um, a little tiny bit of a caramel slash burned sugar kind of character as well. Uh, so aroma's nice. It smells uh, clean. You don't get any sort of alcohol uh, vapor coming off of the aroma. So yeah, uh, now we'll go in towards mouthfeel. So the mouthfeel on this is actually very deceptive. Um, it's actually more of a lighter body than you might expect out of an 8% beer. Uh, it's very similar to, again, a Belgian quad in that uh, it is a strong beer with a very, very light body and high drinkability. There's a low carbonation level in this which allows you to really take in the full breadth of the malts involved. It's just, it's very, very dry feeling um, and just very, very easy to drink a lot of this. And I, like I said, this is around 8% ABV. Uh, now, my refractometer calculations were a bit screwed up because uh, it turns out that refractometers are not the best at handling post-boil high gravity wort readings. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is because sometimes the wort will stratify, which means that you have layers within it of different densities. Um, of sugars and sometimes those more dense sugars will collect towards the bottom of the kettle. Another thing to keep in mind is that even though my refractometer says it has automatic temperature correction, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate and uh, I think that might be another factor here. So my readings are anywhere between 1070 and 1080 for an OG, so I took the average value of 1075 and taking a final gravity of 1015 leads us to about an 8% beer. Uh, so I think it's around there, plus or minus half a percent ABV, um, and I'm definitely happy with that. All right, so now we're gonna move on to flavor. Mm. We heavies are up there with Belgian quads, Russian Imperial stouts, and Doppelbox in terms of just being a pure malt showcase. Um, it really shows what you can do with a malty beer. And, uh, you know, you do get a pretty devilishly strong beer out of it, too. Um, this is a very complicated beer that is only going to improve as it ages. As it stands now, it's a month old, which is actually still pretty young for this beer. Um, but it's, you know, old enough that I can put it on the channel comfortably. Uh, it It is a very complex and interesting flavor that is full of nuttiness right now. Caramelized sugars, um, you get that kind of toffee note as well. Um, there's a raisin in there. There's a little tiny bit of a fig in there. Um, but there's a lot of biscuity, nutty, kind of 
just rich and delicious flavor uh, that is coming from this. Uh, and just to top it off, just as designed and just as I hoped for, there is a kiss of roast. Just a tiny little hint of it in the aftertaste. Uh, just enough. Any more in this beer would probably be a little over the top. Uh, but where it stands right now, the balance of that roasted flavor is absolutely perfect. I'm very happy with it. The flavor descriptors I just used for this beer are very similar to the ones that you'd use for the quads and the Doppelbox. Um, so I will try to do everybody a favor here and explain the differences between the flavors that you would get out of those. So this is not as sweet as a Doppelbock, and that might have something to do with the way that this panned out. I think it would be better if it was sweeter. Um, but the main difference is the Doppelbock tends to have a lot more punchiness in the melanoidin department as well as in the uh, uh, just a sheer amount of like dark, rough, bread crusty, bready, deep, rich Munich type notes. Um, because the Doppelbach is traditionally brewed with almost 100% Munich malt. Um, this had a pale malt as its base malt, and there's a big difference in terms of what that can do for flavor. Um, this is, I would say, probably not as rich as a Doppelbach, um, but it has its own set of complexity, which is really nice. Now, it's probably more similar to a Belgian quad in that a Belgian quad um, actually has relatively similar types of grain uh, used in it. Quads are also built with a large amount of pale base malt. You also have some dark caramel malts in there as well. Uh, Special B comes to mind and a couple other types of Belgian caramel malts and aromatic malts which are similar. It's similar to the grain bill that I used here but one of the big differences there is the addition of candy sugar which thins out the body even more than this one and ends up uh, kind of creating a more of a molasses character to the beer. And then the massive difference between the quad and this is obviously yeast. Uh, the, the English yeast here is a very neutral yeast. If it's throwing in the esters, it's probably coming through as like a slight raisin flavor. Um, but that's really about it. It's kind of minerally. Um, I think that works out pretty well. I think the water on this is pretty good. It's definitely not out of balance like some of my other dark beers have been. Yeah, I'd say there's definitely a distinct minerality to this. I think the biggest difference between the other two beers that I mentioned and this beer is the biscuity, bready, full flavor um, uh, that comes as a base, basically. And also that little, little tiny bit of roasted malt. Uh, it does make a pretty big difference in the beer and distinct, it kind of sets it a little bit apart. I do think the beer could be improved by sweetening. Um, I could back sweeten it, sure, but I don't really do that. I think if I had more unfermentable sugars and just mashed a little bit higher, uh, I could make a big difference in really delivering a lot of that full maltiness. Um, right now it is a bit dry uh, feeling for its style, and while that makes it more drinkable, doesn't necessarily make it a better beer. I think some of the, the harsher characteristics of some of those dark caramel malts are coming through a little bit more. It's not in an offensive way. Um, I will say that it's definitely not something where I overdid it on the grain bill. It just needs a little bit more time, uh, maybe a little tiny bit more sweetness to mask that out. But like I said, this will continue to improve um, and really get better over time. The, the excellent drinkability of a Scotch Ale is here. Um, the fullness of flavor from the malts is here and uh, the overall experience is a positive one for sure. There are a couple things that I could definitely do to improve this beer, and the first thing is obviously not starting with as much water. Uh, so I started with eight and a half gallons, which was too much. I ended up having a lot of overflow in my mash tun. So I would say maybe bring that down to seven and a half, but if you do that, you're gonna end up with not as much uh, liquid you know, post mash. So you might have to sparge a little bit, or you could use a technique that I'm gonna do tomorrow with a claw hammer system when I brew my Russian Imperial Stout on it, and that is double mashing. And so I will be employing that technique tomorrow, hopefully with success. I've never done it before, uh, but You'll see how it turned out, not next video, but two videos from now. Uh, so stay tuned for that. It's gonna be a winter full of very large beers. So that is definitely something that you can use if you're short on mash tun space. Um, and I think it would work pretty well with this system in particular. So overall, I am very happy with this beer. It turned out very well. Um, and it is a uh, decent learning experience in terms of how to uh, to do high gravity worts on the claw hammer system, and that's exactly the intent that I had in mind for this brew. Um, and I got a pretty tasty beer on top of that. And I imagine scaling this beer down into its, you know, 40, 60, 80 shilling versions uh, really would make for some very interesting content and some very interesting beers. So I'll be definitely doing those 
later on. All right, everybody, that's going to be it. So please, before you go, don't forget to like this video. It makes a big difference for me. Uh, also, if you like this content on a regular basis, hit that subscribe button. So I will kick out a new Grain of Glass video roughly every two to three weeks. Uh, but if you don't want to wait around that long, feel free to follow me on Instagram. That's at the Apartment Brewer on Instagram. Uh, I'll post there pretty frequently. And also, up here in the corner, I'm going to link my Patreon, where you'll see a lot of additional video content. So go check that out, and uh, feel free to support me if you want to. I appreciate it. Comment down below if you want to discuss the beer, the brew, the claw hammer system, the weird Scottish music that I picked for this video, and whatever comes to your mind. I'd love to discuss it with you. I do read every single comment, and I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can. In the description box, you're also going to find the recipe for the claw hammer system, so check that out if you want to duplicate this beer for yourself. You'll also find a link to the claw hammer system, as well as the rest of my brewing gear that I have, uh, if you want to check those out as well. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this beer, and probably keep it on tap for a while and see how it ages. So anyway, until the next video, cheers.